If you would, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 30. I think we're going to kind of use this chapter tonight as something of a commentary or insight. If you remember as we're teaching through the book of Romans, you remember Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've seen quite a bit of worldly wisdom employed in a lot of the situations as we're dealing with Abraham, Isaac, and tonight continuing our journey through the Word with Jacob. We're going to be looking at quite a bit of insight with um, Jacob, and remember his two wives from last week. He had worked seven years, and the only thing he wanted was to be married to Rachel. At the seven-year time period, what happened? He woke up the next morning, it wasn't Rachel. It was her sister Leah. And he confronted Laban about it, and Laban um, told Jacob, just fulfill your week to her, in other words, just continue on with the marriage, and I will give you Rachel as well, and you just work for me for another seven years. So he got seven years for the wife that he didn't want, and you can already kind of imagine the situation, the, 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 the chaos, the pain, the, just all of that that's going to go into that situation. So now he has both wives working another seven years, and you already see kind of the turmoil that's going to affect that family. So we're going to see that um, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah all need to change their thinking. That verse in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, should be really powerful for us. We're going to see as we move through chapter 30 that because they decided, already having God's plan, already having God's revealed will, these three individuals, all three of them in this chapter, employing their own strategy to fulfill God's will brings a whole different set of problems to them. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in chapter 30. They're going to be employing nothing but worldly wisdom and tactics to every situation as it arises. And we'll notice that every time they do that, it's going to add more problems to the situation. Where we left off in chapter 29 last week, um, Jacob married... Leah, Jacob married Rachel. Leah was the one that was unloved, and God blessed Leah. So she had several sons before we come into chapter 30. And we saw something of a growing process for Leah, but also a very painful process, as you can see. In the first um, three birds, we see that desire with every single kid that is born, especially a son that is born to Leah, we see that desire that's going to bring her husband closer to her or bring her husband to a place of staying with her, bring her husband to a place of loving her. And even with three sons, we see that not really happening. So we can kind of feel the pain that Leah is going through. But then we see Judah being born, a name meaning praise, and we don't see the same verbiage after Judah is born. We see her taking more of her identity in God than as her, not necessarily her role as a wife, but from her husband, who isn't giving her attention. So chapter 30, now, when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. One of the first things that gets us in trouble is looking in the wrong direction. One of the first things. You can imagine also kind of how Rachel is feeling. Rachel finally gets married to the man that she wants to get married to. But first, her older sister gets married off to Jacob. Kind of a twist, isn't it? Jacob's the one that's a bit of a swindler. He cheated. He didn't have to, but he cheated to get the birthright and the blessing out of his father, Isaac. As soon as he gets to Laban... Laban cheats and tricks Jacob to make sure that the birthright of the firstborn is fulfilled in his family. He says, well, that's our culture, that the older one is supposed to be married first. There's no other way around it. <laughs> Funny he didn't bring that up seven years ago. Why would you? Free labor. The only wages that he wanted was to marry 
Rachel. But now we have Rachel, who is used to having one up on her older sister. You remember in the verbiage in chapter 29 that Leah was not, she was kind of homely looking. But Rachel was not. She was very beautiful. Everything about her was extremely beautiful. Beauty only gets you so far. When she sees that she is bearing no children and she becomes envious of her sister, there's a lot really packing into that one. She is not able to fulfill what she would like to as a wife, as a mother. It's very likely she desires children. We'll kind of get back to that point. But she would have been looked down on as being cursed. You remember in Genesis chapter 9, the command that was given to Noah and his family Once they stepped off the ark, God says, and for you, go forth, so leave, go out and do something, and multiply. If you could not have kids and you were barren, it was looked as kind of a divine interference that you were cursed. So now her sister that she's always kind of had one up on doesn't really seem that way anymore. Looking in the wrong direction always gets us in trouble. Looking at what someone has that we don't have always does what? It prompts us to do something dumb. Well, Bob got a new car. I want a new car. Can't really afford a new car, but the debt's worth it. I know we've said that one a lot. The debt's worth it. (laughs) It's really not. But when we're looking in the wrong direction or we're looking over at the fence, we're trying to, what is it, keeping up with the Joneses, when we're doing those things, we're not looking at our blessings anymore. She had a great blessing because her husband loved her. She wanted to have kids, missing the fact that she had her husband's love. Leah had kids, but was chasing after her husband's love. So you kind of see both sisters, and we're going to see this rivalry and this competition extending for quite some time. So she sees that she has no kids, and Rachel is envying her sister. That would have been really hard. You have a father-in-law with all his stuff and all his servants. You're essentially under his roof with not one wife, but two wives. Both these wives are sisters. Who throws the meanest comments? Really close friends, because they know everything about you. So not only are these two sisters married to the same guy under the same roof, but they don't like each other. Each one has something the other one doesn't have, and they're both, they're both very envious about it. And we can already see the tension in the household. Not to mention all this um, paternal, maternal drama. drama. And drama in the marriage is just hard. But they have four young kids also thrown into the mix. So you can just kind of see the storm that is brewing. So Rachel envies her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Something else kind of in our logic, isn't it? Clearly, the problem isn't with Jacob. Jacob has four sons. But she is passing that blame To Jacob, we do that, don't we? When there's something really bothering us, really, even though it's got nothing to do with the person, that person's going to become a sponge. And you're just going to throw everything you have at that person. That is what she does. Give me children or else I'll die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. That's a pretty fierce statement. That's what happens. Jacob doesn't know. There's nothing he can do. He doesn't know what to do, and just myself being a husband, being a man, it's typically always, well, I'm going to jump right in, I'm going to fix it. Even when Megan isn't actually asking me for my help, she's just kind of venting or letting me know how things are, my mind's already stopped, kind of like, she's still going on, but I'm like, "Mm." (laughs) and in my mind, how can I fix this? So by the time she finishes her sentence, and she really what she wants is a hug, I was like, babe, guess what? I got a four-step plan. We're going to whip this thing right around. That's not what she wants to hear. Or if I can't fix it, there's nothing I can do about it. It really makes me angry. 
And there's nothing that Jacob can do in this situation. So he was aroused, and his anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, Am I in the place of God, who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? A couple of interesting things here. First, it would seem that he understands. He puts all of this back on God. Why? There's nothing that Jacob can do about it. There's nothing that Jacob can do about it. The problem is not with Jacob. Jacob understands the problem is with Rachel, and it's between Rachel and God. God is the one that has withhold, withheld. God is the one that has withheld, and God is the one that opens the womb, or God is the one that blesses. But we see him lashing out in anger. We don't see him doing something that he should have learned from his father. We've seen these issues before, haven't we? We saw this issue with Isaac and Rebekah. What did Isaac do? And what did Rebekah do? Isaac, knowing that his wife was barren, he went and prayed. And he went and prayed for his wife. Rebekah, when she felt the struggle in her womb, she didn't blame that on her husband. Which has happened. You did this to me. <laughs> we see Rebecca also going to the Lord and praying and seeking counsel from God. So that's what the two of them should have done. Again, they need to not be conformed to the world, but rather they need to change their thinking. Verse 3, so she said, here is my maid Bilhah, go into her. And she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife. And Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. Hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a lot packed in that one. Instead of going to the Lord, which Jacob should have known to do, or Rachel asking him to inquire of God, or her inquiring of God, she goes back to a, a plan B that we've seen in the past, haven't we? We saw this with Abraham and Sarah. Oh, Abe, honey, God said you were going to have a kid. But he didn't say anything really directly about me having a kid. Here's Hagar. And that didn't work out very well. In fact, to this day, it is still not working out very well as Ishmael is the father of the Arab peoples. Why are they going into this now? It was a widely practiced thing. So Jacob would have lived somewhere around 2005 to like 1880 BC. This was practiced so much, it actually made it into the Code of Hammurabi in about 1750, 1755 BC. Hammurabi being, I think, the sixth king in the first Babylonian dynasty. That was kind of one of the laws of the land. If you were a servant or if you were the, the, the maid and you saw that your mistress, your master, was not able to have kids, but you were able to have kids, it was your duty to fulfill that, that purpose, that the lineage would be able to carry on. It's probably not literal that the child was conceived and born on the knees, but it was something that was practiced. That's something that gets us in trouble, isn't it? Well, if the large majority agrees that something is right or something should be tolerable, we should accept it. That's the kind of thinking that gets us in trouble. That's the kind of thinking that gets the churches in trouble. Instead of going with the grain, or instead of going against the grain like we're supposed to, instead of standing out, being separated, we decide to just kind of go along with everything else. It's also important to note that we're going to see God bless Rachel as we have seen God bless Leah. We don't see that here. And we'll continue on with that premise uh, here in a few verses. 
So we see two sons being born through Bilhah, essentially to Rachel. And we see her mindset in the situation. In verse 8, don't we? I have, with great wrestlings, I've wrestled with my sister. Can you start to feel the tension in the home now? The, the level of desperation. Situations that are made hard for us to turn us to God, she has used to turn to something that the world practices. And on top of that, she believes that she has prevailed against her sister. So you can see how important it is to her, just kind of for lineage purposes or to win the competition. And you can kind of see some of the animosity that's driving through the house. Verse 9, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob, his wife. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes, so she called his name Gad. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher, meaning happy. So we see even though Rachel had, I'm sorry, um, Leah had four sons that were hers and Jacob's. Rachel has two sons that were technically Jacob and Bilhah's. She believes that she has wrestled with and won over her sister. So we see things getting a little dodgier when now Leah sees that she is no longer having kids at the moment. So now she is going to give up her handmaid as well. When we try to do things on our own power, our own steam, our own efforts through the flesh, we start adding more and more problems, especially more complicated problems, into the mix. Now Reuben went in the days of the wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Here's where the chapter starts to get a little bit weirder. <laughs> it's like the greatest Jerry Springer episode ever. Mandrakes uh, was a, a plant that apparently would grow fruit. I've never seen one, but it was the root that they were after. Kind of hard to find. They would dig up the root. They believed that it was an aphrodisiac. That's what Leah is turning to now. This is what we have. Now I can bear, um, have more children, not just Zilpah, but also myself. I'm going to win this thing. Sounds really dumb, doesn't it? The Lord said that he was going to bless Jacob. The Lord said that he was going to bless and is blessing Leah. Why go through the whole thing with the mandrakes? We can probably all answer that question, can't we? How many times do we take something or pursue something when we really know that we don't need to? Often enough, it's really on our hearts, well, God has called me here to do something. But we don't leave it in God's hands. We take extra steps, extra measures to try and secure ourselves that just complicates the situation. And we typically don't realize the complications of those efforts until the choice is already made. So we see Reuben, Leah's firstborn, coming back from the field. He has mandrakes, and Rachel notices what she has. Oh, that's an aphrodisiac. This whole region, you have to remember, they're up in kind of that, that whole Mesopotamian empire. They're up in the north in Padan Aram. Superstitions, like they are now, run really high. Don't raise your hands, but how many of us as believers like to follow... Um, the word that's stuck in my head now is aphrodisiac, and that's not the right word. Horoscopes. It doesn't even start with the same letter. How many people follow horosco hor horosco horoscopes? Horoscopes. That's horos, horoscopes. How many of us follow this, those? <laughs> Too many people. I wonder what's in the store for me now. The big thing that's going across social media right now that I've noticed is what kind of person start dating based off of your sign. That's the word we're going to go with. I actually saw <laughs> So we base a lot of our decisions off of this process. 
or ones like it. We allow superstition to rule in our lives. So Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. That would have been really hard. The competition is for the amount of kids. For Rachel, the amount of kids equals a secure, permanent foundation for where you know, all the blessings are going to go. But that's not what it means for Leah. Leah, the more kids she has, the more likely it is that her husband is going to love her more. And what's in the center of all that? At the moment, it's the mandrake or um, the love apple. It's in the middle of the two of them. And one is asking from the other, I want those mandrakes. What is she saying? I would like to take what your son found so that I can have more kids on my side. Mm. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband, but you take away my son's mandrakes also? That's pretty, uh, <laughs> that's pretty snippy. Is it a small matter? Leah sees the marriage as something real. Well, Jacob sees it as something more of a, well, it was a contract. He didn't intend to marry Leah. But the verbiage suggested in verse 15 is that Jacob is no longer at all dwelling with Leah, but instead is spending most of that time with Rachel. And Rachel said, therefore, he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. So Leah is going to give the mandrakes to Rachel and Rachel is basically going to say, all right, well, sorry, babe, you're staying tonight in house B tonight. So when Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, you must come into me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes, and he lay with her that night. Verse 17, and God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Interesting the verbiage and the terminology that we're seeing in this passage. But it would seem that Leah, at some point, has started praying. Has, well, she's been hurting, and she is lifting those things up to God. So we see that God is um, performing that blessing with Leah. We didn't see that verbiage with Bilhah or with Zilpah. So Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So he called his name Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a cis son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. That's kind of a, we'll come back to that real short snippet about Dinah. But here's a, stas- a sad state of affairs. So she gives Zilpah the maid. And she has two sons there. Now she has two sons here. It's important to listen to what she says. God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. It's important for us to understand how bad that is. <laughs> it's super bad. <laughs> Wickedly bad for a number of reasons. And the spiritual points carry for us as well. First, if we have sin in our lives and we are not judged or punished for it right away, what typically starts to trickle into our minds? Must not be that big a deal. God's not that worried about it. Or it's permissible for me. So we continue in that pattern of sin, and we kind of see where that situation goes. So that's kind of the first thing for us, and that is a very poisonous thing. The second thing, and this is something that is incredibly poisonous for the churches, we see the will of God circumstantially driven. And what I mean by that is, if things are going well, that's because God has blessed it and it's the plan of God. If things are not going well, I made a bad decision. She has taken in a great deal of sin into her family. 
something that God can't abide in. She's taken a great deal of sin in her family and said what? God has blessed me in this way. So back to the second one. It's important for us to realize, especially as believers, if things are going very well, awesome. Does that mean it's the will of God? It certainly can. If things are going poorly, we like to think that, well, there's no way that God's hand is in this. How many times was, still, how many times was Paul drug out of a city and stoned or whipped or just not allowed to go? He didn't just quit. We see so many of those situations where those circumstances were used essentially to kind of to press, to squeeze in on all sides of the individual to make them do something. I.e., we'll see in chapter 31, this is not where Jacob is supposed to stay. God wanted him to move and to go back to where he had anointed the rocks that we saw a few chapters ago. So what is he going to do? Sometimes we don't want to leave. So God puts the squeeze on us a little bit changes circumstance, changes certain things to where we do leave. Back to the third thing, what was the amount of sin that she is heaping on? We often will see in these passages, well, how come God didn't smite Jacob or Rachel or Leah for violating the concept, the, the, the covenant of marriage? Because we see even in the Gospels, Jesus said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. He's quoting that passage from Genesis chapter 2. What do we see in that passage? God made them male and female. So there's part one. And, he's, and what else did he say? The two, the two shall become one flesh. Not a, the three shall become one flesh, or the four shall become one flesh. So we see them bringing additions that shouldn't be into the family. So how come God didn't strike them down right away? What's even more interesting is how he just kind of lets them play that situation out. They want to use their wisdom. God lets them see where the misstep was. And in verse 20, it says, Afterward, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. We will be coming back to Dinah here in a few chapters, but daughters weren't favored as highly as the sons were. The sons were the ones carrying on the lineage. Verse 22, Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. So now we see God essentially answering to Rachel. At some point, she, it would seem, has started the dialogue with God as well. And God answers her, and now God opens her womb. So it's quite the contrast from verse 22 and verse 3. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. She was expecting another son, and she did. We will see Benjamin step on the scene. We're going to, starting I think in chapter 36, we're going to see a lot more kind of dumped into Joseph. Why? Because Joseph was the firstborn to Jacob and Rachel. So now you can see from a very, just a young age, how much was probably put into Joseph. Joseph is the one that had what we typically render as the colorful coat. We've seen the all the movies and hopefully read the passages. But that word for colorful coat likely means long coat. Long-sleeved and long-robed. That's important. Why is that important? Because if you were working in the fields, you didn't have long sleeves. You don't have long-flowing robes because what would happen? They'd get dirty. Or they'd get tattered. I don't know that I've ever seen a gal wearing her Sunday best dress gardening because you're going to get it all tore up and dirty and whatever else on there. So you see all of this extra kind of favor going into Joseph. Verse 25, and it came to pass, did I skip something? Nope, I don't think so. When Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, send me away that I may go to my own place and to my own country. It is on Jacob's heart to leave. But this also gives us a timeline. How long did he work for Leah? 
Seven years. How long did he have to work for Rachel after that? Seven years. Marital troubles. Now with four women. All these kids. One house, 14 years. That's the amount of chaos that is surrounding Jacob and his decision-making process. And now he goes to Laban and tells Laban, it's time for me to go home. I came here looking for a wife. How long was he supposed to be gone? Two days. Two days turned into 14 years real quick. And he still has a few more years in the process. 14 years are up. He's ready to depart with what he has, his family. Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I served you and let me go. For you know my service, which I have done for you. And Laban said to him, please stay. If I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Laban is not interested in the God that has blessed him because of Jacob. Mm. It's kind of interesting that we're not rarely as interested with the source of the blessing than we are with the blessing itself. We get very distracted by it. It says he's learned by experience. It's not a very good word. The literal meaning of that word is he's learned by divination. Going back to that worldly wisdom. What kind of divination? All sorts of kinds. They would read stars. They would read bones. All the people read tea leaves. We use tarot cards now. We use um, horoscopes. Oh, now I can say it. We use horoscopes to kind of determine what decisions. When do they release those horoscopes? on the first or the day before the new month starts. Why? So you know how to plan your month. Congratulations, that's divination. So it's by divination that he figures out that the source of why Laban is so blessed and growing so much is because Jacob is with him. He doesn't want Jacob to go. He wants to do what he can now to get Jacob to stay. This is a problem for uh, uncle-slash-father-in-law Laban. Because now the ball is in the court of Jacob. So now we get to see Jacob try and pull one on Laban. Then he said, name me your wages and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, Jacob has a plan. Jacob has a great plan. You know how I have served you and how your livestock have been with me. I really like that about Jacob. Probably won't say that a whole bunch. But what we can really look at is the testimony of Jacob in the workforce. He had taken care of... <laughs> That's what you get falling asleep. <laughs> um, man, I lost track on that one. That was really loud. Jacob can say that he protected the livestock and really grew the livestock of Laban. Jacob had blessed Laban in that way, and Laban had become very rich by it. So he says, you know how I have served you. Really should be a question for us as well. Us as believers in the workforce, working as if we're working for the Lord, can we say the same thing? You know how I've worked for you. Yeah, you're terrible at your job. That's not the testimony we should be leaving. For what you had before I came was little. And it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now, when shall I also provide for my own house? We get to see a level of maturity in Jacob. We didn't really see this before. We see him more as a homebody, not somebody that was wanting to care and provide for his household. Now he does. So he said, Laban, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything, meaning... You know, no money. He's likely meaning no more wives. <laughs> if you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Not only is he going to gain something, but he is going to continue working in the same capacity for Laban. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and all the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. What is Jacob asking for? You have all the white ones. I want all the ones that don't look anything like yours. 
a complete separation. Anything speckled, spotted, striped, we'll see, completely separated from all of Laban's, all of other one color sheep. He wants to go through and remove all of them. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. Complete separation of his wages. Laban can at no point call Jacob a cheat or a thief because all of his animals look completely different. And he's, he kind of already knows Laban, doesn't he? When it comes up in that day that you're trying to accuse me of something, because again, Laban really doesn't want to let him go, and we'll see that again here in the next chapter. Laban doesn't want to let him go. Jacob's telling him, my righteousness is going to speak for me. I will be vindicated because you can clearly see that all my animals look completely different than yours. And if there is one that looks like one of yours mixed into my flock, you can just consider it stolen. That's pretty bold, isn't it? So we see Jacob also starting to hang things on God as well. God said, and we'll see in the vision in chapter 31 that kind of backs his chapter a little bit, God said he was going to bless Jacob. In fact, maybe we'll just read that one section real quick. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the rocks are streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. That's the vision. That's it. What is that vision? Pay attention to these animals. That's what you're going to get. Look south. That's where you're going. I am going to do this. I am going to do this. And Laban said, Oh, that it were according to your word. Two meanings here to this one. A, that's what you want. That's what you're going to get. Or B, don't try and pull a fast one. If your word's going to be true, you know, that's what we're going to do. Two men, on top of all the other situations developed in 14 years, we have the two patriarchs of these two different families now that just really don't trust one another. So he removed that day the male goats that were speckled and spotted, all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had some, some white in it, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and gave them into the hand of his sons. Then he put three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So he stays true to his word. He takes some, he goes uh, three days' journey away. That's where he's to set up his temporary homestead while he continues to work for Laban. Verse 37. This is where the chapter gets really weird. Now Jacob took for himself rods of green poplar and of the almond and chestnut trees and peeled white strips in them and exposed the white which was in the rods. So he grabbed these green rods. He peels some of the green back to where it exposes a whiteness in the rod. And the rods which he had peeled, he set before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering troughs where the flocks came to drink, so that they should conceive when they came to drink. Another superstition. That word for um, conceive is yacham. Um, Something about putting them in front of the animals they believed would make them more willing to conceive. God said he was going to do something. Jacob is trying to take extra measures to make sure that it is done. Then Jacob separated the lambs and made the flocks face toward the streaked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. But he put his own flocks by themselves and did not put them with Laban's flock. And it came to pass... Whenever the stronger livestock conceived, that Jacob placed the rods before the eyes of the livestock in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. But when the flocks were feeble, he did not put them in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, female and male servants, and camels and donkeys. So he's essentially trying to make stronger flocks for himself <laughs> and weaker flocks for Laban, which will still bring on more problems. 
we can see a lot of the hurt and a lot of the problem, but a lot of the beginnings of these things kind of in this chapter. The book of Romans, the epistle of Romans, was written to the churches, believers in Rome. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to change our thinking. Our thinking can't be, God's going to bless me, but just in case he doesn't, I'm going to make sure that I'm blessed anyway. That's not the right thought. Everybody really likes a plan B. I like to think of myself as somebody that absolutely plans ahead. I like to establish or identify friction points and mitigate those friction points before they even come up. But what am I doing? If I try and stand on a place of faith, but circumvent that just in case God fails, that's not faith. That's the opposite of faith. Because we make those plans believing that God is not going to be true to his word or believing that God doesn't have good things in store for us. Jacob was told that he was going to be blessed. Jacob already knew that the covenant and the blessing was going to go through his bloodline. And we see Jacob at any point in time could have stopped the whole thing. No, I'm not taking Bilhah. No, I'm not taking Zilpah. Why did he? He was probably pressed and frustrated. Two angry women. One he's trying to avoid, and she's getting angry and pursuing him. One he's trying to pursue, but that one's angry with him because she doesn't have any kids, and she's blaming it on him. What does that turn into? Anything you want, dear. And we see the hardship with that one. But for us as a body, it's time for us to stop taking our eyes off of what it is that the world is doing in mass and thinking it's a great idea and instead taking it back to some place that is truth. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for blessing our evening that we would have time together in fellowship and the ministry of the word. And I pray, God, that it's our hearts and our minds that would be open to your word that we would grow. And that our thinking, our way of thinking, God, would be changed to your way of thinking. And we love you and we praise you and we pray in your name. Amen.